Hello and welcome to Smart Talk, an exciting discussion about what some call the new normal in shipping. I'm Craig Eason from Fathom World. In this Smart Talk session, we'll hear from two startup accelerators about the kind of startups that are finding success in the shipping maritime logistics space. We'll also look at what any startup needs to consider when facing the challenge of linking with an industry that has spent so long operating in a somewhat different way. After we've heard from the Dock, based in Israel, and Port Excel, based in Rotterdam, we'll go to the second part of the Smart Talk, where I'll be talking to representatives from two ship owners, Maersk in Copenhagen and Greek Star in Bergen, Norway. These two companies have made determined steps towards linking with startup communities. They've organised hackathons and have begun to take a journey away from a closed industry to one that one may call ever more connected, more aware of the need to use the same attitudes of other industries in seeking change from the outside. Finally, in this Smart Talk, there's part three of the webinar. This is your chance to converse and network with the Smart Talk panel, as well as discuss ideas and opinions with other people here today. But first, here's Hanan Carmeli, co-founder of The Dock, based in Israel, about the three ingredients startups need for success and why ship owners are starting to listen to these outside voices. Thanks, Craig. Uh, and there is definitely a buzz going on uh, around the topic for our discussion today. In my short presentation, I will try to address the questions of uh, why, that is, what are the drivers behind uh, this, uh, the what, that is, try to put a frame around what's happening. And then I'd like to address the how, uh, which is the method that we at the DOC have adopted towards spreading innovation and also building a business model around it. So let's start with the demand side, the market. Ports and maritime players did experience a gradual change driven by technology, and metrics such as the efficiency of ports, TU capacity on a vessel, crew size operating that vessel have all improved as a result of technology. But these are cases of merely an evolution and not a revolution where the very business paradigm is changing. Fintech, for example, and the introduction of digital banking drove closure of bank branches. Expedia and Booking.com eliminated the role of the travel agent. These are all cases of dramatic revolutions. On the right-hand side, you can see some signals of such revolution arriving in the ports and maritime sectors. Shipping companies, for example, are jockeying for position today and do not view their competition to be the traditional peers, but in many cases, they look at Amazons and the Alibabas of the world as their future competition. Also, the introduction of roles such as VP Innovation and Chief Digital Officers expedite these trends. So this was the demand side. On the supply side, accelerators and entrepreneurs are taking notice. And when matched with the needs, and we will talk more about that match between entrepreneurs and corporates, so when that match takes place, great ideas come to mind. And this is happening especially in technology hubs which are used to think out of the box. As to me personally, I am very familiar with the Israeli ecosystem, which is an example of such an extremely vibrant one. So all in all, cross-pollinating the need side with the supply side in an effective manner is key to innovation. Okay, let's talk about the how. There are three main hold stakeholders which are involved, representatives of the demand side. These are corporates such as ports, terminals, shipping companies, freight forwarders, class societies and others. The second stakeholders are the entrepreneurs which are willing and eager to contribute to the sector. And the third type of stakeholders are the investors which are willing to take the risk and find those opportunities. Now, there are other stakeholders such as the academy and various government agencies under the public-private partnership framework. They all have a role to play, but the top three are the ones which are critical to any acceleration platform. And this is all needed in order to solve the common startup challenge, which, if unhandled, can bring many of the startups to the need to what's called pivot, which is change course, a very costly process, or worse yet, to close doors. And that is that while startups are very creative and a lot of, have a lot of technology talent on board, they are lacking in many cases proper market knowledge. Which is why bringing the three stakeholders together 
is so, is so critical. One of the common and very effective ways to spark uh, ideation or ideas uh, is holding a meetup events and, and uh, different types of pitch events. For example, here on the slide you see such event we held uh, 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 late last year in Israel. Uh, the usual way this is taking place is that uh, you have, as you can see on the right hand side top, an uh, audience made of uh, entrepreneurs and investors. And as you can see at the bottom, usually speakers or panels will uh, consist of uh, experts from the market, in this case here, a uh, CEO of uh, uh, ports and terminals, uh, general managers of, uh, of uh, shipping companies, etc. Last, and this has to do with our business model, is a, a look into the three-way uh, win platform that uh, the doc is all about. So what's in it for startups? They get seed investment, they get incubation and market acceleration services, and a strong go-to-market focus through our corporate partners. For our investors, the, the limited partners, the LPs, they get financial returns and also the right for follow-up investment. And last, corporate partners are getting visibility to open innovation, that is a ticket to the show, and a range of follow-up activities according to their appetite, such as offering a beta site, pilot, a becoming a design partner, even investing in the startup. That's Hanan Kameli, co-founder of The Dog, a startup accelerator based in Israel. A quick reminder that you can begin sending questions and comments for the Smart Talk panel using the window you should see on the screen in front of you. Murray Stragmans is in charge of Port Excel, an accelerator that focuses on finding startups with a focus on solutions for logistics, ports and maritime. Port Excel started in Rotterdam and is growing. As an accelerator, Port Excel awards startups the opportunity to get key help in bringing their product closer to the market. Hi to you all. First, I wanted to start with a short uh, introduction of uh, what Port Excel is and does, and after that, I will uh, touch the main topic of uh, of my presentation, and it's on the corporate involvement uh, within startup programs. Um, Port Excel <coughs> first is the uh, is a global entrepreneurship hub uh, for innovation in the logistics, maritime, and energy sector. So, what we try to do is we try to help startups around the world and make impact on the sectors of logistics, maritime and energy, basically all the sectors that are collected around port areas. For us, it's crucial that it's about entrepreneurship. Uh, so it's more than just startups. It could be st scale-ups and uh, it also could be uh, corporate entrepreneurship. And of course, this is a global game. So that's why we are uh, having a global focus for what we do. What we do is uh, fairly simple. Uh, we do three things. Uh, every year we scout some uh, thousand startups around the world. Uh, we speak to more than 200 of those every year. And then eventually we invite some 30 startups to our selection days uh, in our program, of which eventually are around 15 startups selected into the three-month program. Uh, secondly, we match uh, the startups with corporates. That's an apartment, important value of, uh, of our program. Uh, that means that within uh, three to five months, the startups in our program are pitching to a little bit over a thousand experts from ports, maritime, logistics, energy sectors around the world, thereby boosting their network and uh, also finding their first, second or third client, which makes them into real uh, growing entrepreneurs, of course. And the last thing is accelerating them uh, by our program and by the coaching from our mentors uh, the startups gain some uh, significant speed and make more impact uh, within the sector. The thing we're most proud of is, uh, uh, of course, all the businesses being done by the startups and the corporates, but also very proud of this number. Last year we evaluated our program and uh, all the startups that were in the program gave us an, a number out of 10 uh, how they evaluated the program uh, after they uh, put in quite some, uh, some time but also some other uh, assets from the company. And uh, so we're extremely proud that they, the 10 teams evaluated us at a 9.1 out of 10. Um, that is uh, what we think uh, shows the real impact we make. So uh, I think one of the main topics in, in Maritime is around uh, the um, innovation that's happening in, in the sector. It's as uh, said uh, probably by a lot of others as well, to conserve the sector. And we see that mainly corporates have difficulties innovating. Here you see a small Dilbert cartoon. 
and I'll give you uh, 15 seconds to read it because I think it, it shows what corporates uh, are like also in Maritime. So I think this, uh, this, this cartoon shows uh, a lot of the dynamics that go on in a corporate. Uh, we see that a lot, that corporates struggle in their way to, uh, to deal with innovation in general, but especially with startups. And if you don't have corporates that work with startups, basically you don't have startups because there are no clients for the, for the, for the startups. So this is a little bit the, the, the dynamic we see at a company. Uh, generally, the company is uh, pretty enthusiastic to start working with uh, startups. Well, that's already start, step one. Not all are, but more and more are. And you see a yay, like, hey, startups, uh, innovation, it's really fun. And then at step two, they actually find out it's hard work. So one of our values is also that we say that start innovation, and especially with startups, is not fun at all. It's real hard work. It's really about making value of the technology that the startup has for your company. And only then you start to create value for the company and it starts to become relevant. And there is, I think, a sustainable future for startup and corporate cooperation. So we see a lot of this, uh, of, of this diagram where, uh, especially the, the corporates that invest uh, quite some time, uh, start to get to uh, point four or maybe five where they say, hey, there's actually some value coming out. Uh, but all corporates we work with have quite a learning curve in doing this. So briefly, uh, how we see that the, what the corporates are engaging in is first to scout. They need to scout startups. It's not something they're used to. It's, of course, something we help them with as well. Um, which companies are relevant and what, how do I look at a startup and how do I start with startup? Then the second is to prove uh, value. So is this technology actually valuable for our business? So they start to try and engage in, in pilots uh, with the startup. Um, but also designing a good pilot is difficult. And how do you do a good pilot? How do you do it quickly? Uh, how do you make sure you don't take a year before deciding upon a pilot with a startup because then the startup generally is already broke? So um, that's the second bit. And then the third bit, after the pilot, when success has been um, uh, made with the pilot, so the pilot has been successful, uh, it, it, it comes to making real value because one, one uh, valuable pilot doesn't create value for a big business. So if you had a successful pilot, how are you going to scale up within the company uh, this technology? And only then a corporate is able, if they do these three steps, to create value out of the technology of the startups. And I think that's crucial because when start, uh, corporates start to uh, create value out of uh, working with startups, it's a longer, longer term uh, uh, play field. So that's, uh, in brief, uh, the dynamics that I wanted to share with you, uh, especially on the corporate startup uh, cooperation. I think another aspect, which I won't touch upon in detail right now, is also that a lot of investors find it difficult to look at startups in maritime logistics uh, because it's a totally different sector and all the dynamics around the startups is very different. But that's a topic that we uh, potentially can pick up in the discussion if, uh, if it's relevant. Welcome now to the second part of um, this smart talk where we're going to hear a little bit about the, the point of view from the ship owners and ship operators. So I'm pleased to have with us on the uh, webinar um, Annick Verhoeven from AP Miller Maersk and Matt Duke from Greek Star. So if I could start then with um, Anik, from your perspective, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about what you see as the value that um, a large ship owner, ship operator like AP Muller Maersk or multi-logistics company gets in using or looking at this um, growing startup community. Yeah, I think that, um, thank you first of all for... Uh for, for, for having me and it, it's a very um, uh, relevant topic for us and we are very active uh, at the moment. Um, we, we all believe that, that, that digitization will transform every industry. Um, and I think that the digitization of our industry, the container industry, is still in early stages, but we do believe that it will fundamentally change our industry. Um, we think that we believe we're in a stage where we are beyond uh, using data to, to reduce costs and, and optimize operations uh, solely. We believe we are now at the point where 
Digital engagement with customers is increasingly important. Um, we know that our customers are looking for um, increasing personal, personalization of services. Um, and we are meeting our customers and discussing with them what um, data analytics and software solutions can, um, can be built to, to deliver on those. And of course, um, our success in this will depend on how we combine and expand our digital capabilities, which are um, at the moment uh, very much growing, but of course not something we've had um, for a very long time. And how we combine that with our deep knowledge of the container transportation and logistics business. Um, and so not a single person or team can execute that uh, digital transformation on its own. And so, first of all, we are um, very much focused on integrating digitizations with our business teams, um, where our deep understanding of the core business lies. Um, and besides that, we are accelerating our transformation by cooperating um, with partners, both large um, software companies um, that are building world-class enterprise software, but also uh, new entrants into our industry, uh, digital native companies, startups that are building solutions that, um, that, that our customers uh, want and our customers need. Um, this is why we uh, have um, a number of startup partners around the world that help us uh, to tap into that startup ecosystem and get to know the startups that can help um, accelerate our our digital transformation. Is it a, a problem though, or is it a challenge, I should say, that um, a lot of these ideas come from outside of the maritime or logistics area? Sometimes I hear comments that uh, people from outside the industry don't get, they don't understand the shipping and maritime sector in particular. Is there a challenge there in getting them to, or these ideas from entrepreneurs, to really sort of engage and understand the maritime sector? Or do you see them remaining sort of mostly on the sort of uh, software side of industries and not fully comprehending? I, I agree that um, Many of the startups entering our industry are um, come with the digital capabilities and have not all um, actual experience in our industry. I think I find this the where the where the powerful connection comes in because um, what I do have what I do experience and have experienced is that almost all these startups are extremely interested in learning about our problems, learning about the complexity of our operations, and, 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 uh, and collaborating with us to um, shape their products further, to, um, to grow them, and, and to sometimes change them to, to the needs that we have. So there is definitely um, a, some uh, part of the process where we, as, a, as, as the um, industry, experts help these startups um, with the operational knowledge that, 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 that they sometimes need. But I don't see um, any issues. I think we are extremely happy that these startups come with very strong digital capabilities and, and software backgrounds uh, that we so much need to, to drive this agenda. Do you, do you think that the um the startups that you approach, um, well, let me put the question another way. The, the, the startup community may have some wonderful ideas, but not realize that they are suitable um, for a company like yours or they match. How do you go about trying to match what you consider to be a challenge or a problem or something that you could refine with the ideas that are out there? Is this where the accelerators come in and why companies like A.P. Mullermersk and others are engaging with the accelerators, you're using them to find the ideas to make that match. So, obviously, there are 
so many startups. I mean, the startup ecosystem is so large. Um, it's also super fast moving. New players entering all the time. Startups pivoting. Uh, startups exiting or being acquired. Um, so our partners are uh, are crucial to to find the right startups for our problem uh, together with us. So. Um, we we describe a problem or a need that we have, and and together with uh, with the partners like like the doc, um, we we try to find the relevant startups that could potentially help us with solving these problems. And then from there, it's it's very much about engaging and getting to know the team and their vision, um, seeing the product. Uh, sometimes it's uh, you know in a demo version or it's. Um, it's, it's it's sometimes the product is up and running and we could we could actually test it and through that process you you find out whether there is a match so i think the the partners really help in finding the relevant startups and from there um we are uh, we are engaging with these teams ourselves and and see if, if the solution is suitable for, for us ap Malamers got our particularly most tankers had a hackathon uh, last year and and Matt Greig Star, um, you had a hackathon recently as well, and I presume from my understanding of hackathons, this is where you ask people to come in and sit in a room intensely for a day, two days, three days, a weekend, and try and find a particular solution to a problem. How was what can you tell me about the hackathon that you had recently and um, how? you then look to develop whatever you get out of a hackathon? Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, first of all, thanks for having me uh, on the, um, the webinar. Appreciate that. Um, why a hackathon? Well, <clears throat> I don't know how everyone else's situation is, but for, for us in merchant shipping, uh, the reality is, is that it's uh, quite a hard time. So we don't have huge amounts of, uh, of uh, income to use, and we have a pretty stressed and pressed organization that, that is trying to do as much as possible, as safely as possible. So uh, the, the idea of a hackathon for us is if we want to hack the business processes, if we want to look at doing things differently, um, you need to combine the, the business knowledge and some kind of digital native new way of thinking knowledge, some kind of uh, uh, digital expertise in a room together to rapidly uh, get understanding of how you could change by using new, uh, new technology. And we have to do it in a hackathon, to be perfectly honest, because we need to rapidly find out what is this, can it help us save money, can it help us have a a better environmental footprint, can it make us safer, or could it lead to new top-line opportunities by developing existing business models or introducing new ones? And if I don't have the opportunity to get everybody together when there is no time for these things during the normal working day, then it's very hard for us to make a logical assessment of if we should go ahead with the technology or not. So hackathons for me you, are just a mechanism for, for brainstorming and testing ideas. Where do you go to get the brains for your brainstorming? Where do you go to get the, uh, the people to come in and take part in a hackathon? How do you find them? Well, I guess I'm fortunate in that um, I've worked in uh, the digital side of shipping for... Um, 16 years, and I was fortunate I had a period of working in a, in a technology company, Collinsburg Digital. So to be honest, I get the people from my contact network. Uh, perhaps the biggest value you'll ever get from going to a conference or, or joining one of these sorts of uh, web seminars is to increase your contact network, to learn, to listen, to find out what people are doing and find something that's exciting. Um, but also, remember, well, you, you, just to, to share a, a, um, a degree of um, experience, uh, uh, not every shipping company has done the basic stuff. So before you have to start looking at getting the hottest and sexiest startup into the building, 
if you've still got paper-based processes that could be very easily digitalized, or if you're still making decisions based on uh, retroactively looking at reports or Excel spreadsheets, then there's quite a lot of low-hanging fruits that we need to kind of introduce what big data is, introduce the idea of moving to predictive uh, decision support. So one of the outcomes of the hackathon was just a tiny little bit of AI where we could right-hand click on a new oil trend and it says, oh, it looks like uh, Auxiliary Engine 2 has been using much more lube oil than normal. Auxiliary Engine 1 and Auxiliary Engine 3 were, were uh, on average. And, and, and having that in a kind of a proactive uh, dashboard rather than having to look through all the Excel spreadsheets. So the buzzwords are there. You have to have a data lake. You have to have the, the analytics. You have to have a bit of AI. But, but it's very practical. It, it's down on the kind of nuts and bolts of what a ship owning company does. So it's very much on sort of the nuts and bolts ang angles that you say. The sort of, it, it, you make it sound both appealing and very unsexy at the same time there. Like it's, uh, you know, there's some very sort of particular solutions that you may be looking for. Right hand click to find out what the lube oil trend is on the main engine. Uh, it doesn't sound like that's the sort of thing that you would go to a startup to find the solution for, but they're nonetheless they are kind of incremental improvements that you would drive for uh, within, a, within a ship operator. Yeah, there is a, a kind of a backdrop here, um, uh, which I would describe in two words, um, hard work. <laughs> and that is, um, yeah. before having any type of hackathon, uh, the process here was to, to have stakeholder alignment between um, top to bottom. So I've discussed with board, with management team, with uh, technical experts, with ship managers, all sorts of different people. Um, what are our main challenges today? And do you have any ideas of how digital technology could give us opportunities? And do you have any ideas of where digital opportunities um, give risk to what we do? Um, so uh, going into the hackathon, I had a, a, a structured overview of these are our pain points, these are our cost drivers, these are the things people would really love to know before it happens instead of after it happens. And you know what, maybe 80% of it was, yep, this sounds like classic shipping. But 20% was, ooh, no, I've not come across that before, that's interesting, let's do a little bit of research. So, so to be honest with you, Craig, it's, no, it's not glamorous, it's not sexy, it's not super Silicon Valley, it's just hard work and doing the, the homework to find out where our challenges are and then having the time and a person that is given the task to structure it up and to help people understand. So a hackathon is meant to be a training opportunity and it's meant to be fun. It's one of those few uh, times where I can say to a big room of people, if we fail, that's great, because then we know this is not an area to invest more time and effort in, and we'll have a nice uh, cake <laughs> at the end of it and celebrate our failure. Um, but at the same time, if we find out that moving to predictive uh, dashboarding and uh, some machine learning to help us make better decisions is good, we'll also celebrate that with a cake. Um, so, you know, I know everyone thinks of, you know, I don't know, Silicon Valley and, and it's all sexy and it's all amazing and we're going to go to a thousand conferences to say how clever we are. But really, I just think of this as just normal day-to-day -day work now, isn't it? There's all these different technologies and innovations coming out. So as a, as a, a kind of a solid business, you have to find a way to, to, to find out the value on it. Good. I'm going to bring in uh, Mare and Hanan back into the conversation <coughs> now. And uh, this is a point where I can remind people on the uh, Smart Talk to use the chat function, which is one of the windows on the screen in front of you, to ask questions and put points across um, to um, the participants, to our Smart Talk um, speakers here. But uh, Mare, I'm going to uh, bring you in here because you and I had a chat, I think it must have been almost a year ago, when uh, we were talking about um, the second um, installments of the Port Excel when you were looking at uh, bringing in um, a number of uh, startups and entrepreneurs. When you bring in these entrepreneurs, they come in for a particular period. I believe it might be around three months or a year. Um, I'm under the impression that a lot of 
startup accelerators focus on three months, but do you do it for slightly longer? And is that because within the maritime and shipping industries or the port industries, which you are closely aligned with, the expectations are that it will take longer to, to actually achieve that goal of having an entrepreneurial idea, a startup, become something that can fit into the market? Well, I think there are two aspects to this. Uh, one is the startup and one is the corporate. And I think um, the, startups we, the startups we see are generally very experienced startups. So the average age of the teams that we have in our program is 40 years. These are guys and, and, and women from, from, you know, that have been working on the oil platform, be working on a, as a captain on the ship and saw a problem and are, and are fixing it. So they need time it's a business to business environment so i mean um, if you build a pizza delivery app today you can have a client tomorrow right you build the site you push a pay button and you find somebody on the street to buy a pizza and you have a client tomorrow this is a different environment so you you need to talk to quite some corporates and get to know what their issue is and find out how your solution fits in there and start a pilot to demonstrate the value and 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 that all takes time decision making in corporates take time so it's from a startup perspective perspective they need time to find the right uh, market fit for their uh, for their proposition and find the right clients that are actually well maybe the front runners that that want to go with this. The other side is the corporate. And we said that see that the corporate struggle. First of all, there are not many corporates that are in, in maritime and, and energy and, and logistics that are considering startups as a as a part of their innovation solution. That's one. But we do have more. And this I think this group of corporates that realize that that startups and, and innovation play an important role for strategy of a company. Uh, that, that group is growing, but those companies aware that, that they actually aware that startups could play a role, they have a, I think at least three year learning curve of how to deal with startups and how to actually create value out of what startups is bringing them. So I, first, first of all, you know, I get people from corporates coming at me, so like, okay, startup. So, so what should I do with the startup? Should I buy them? Is that as well? That's not the only option. Uh, maybe you can start and try and see if the technology is actually relevant for you. And, and from there, the learning, okay, we're going to start a pilot. How do you set up a pilot contract with a startup? What is a pilot contract different than a normal contract that we do when we buy a machine from Siemens? So all this learning starts, and it's for one person in the organization, but also the business, business guy, but also the technical guy, also the finance guy, also the procurement guy, they all go through learning curves. How do we deal with startups? And that's only for the pilot. After that, when the pilot has been successful, in the best case, worst case is it's not successful, best case is successful, then there still has, no, has, has not been created any real business value. Of course, there's a lot of soft value, like learning and, and inspiration, but the real business value has not been created. It starts when after successful pilot, you scale up this technology within the organization over the 60 terminals this company has worldwide. And that is a whole different game as well. So we see that on both sides there, for, for startups, the struggle getting into the company and realizing how to bring actually value to the companies and the corporates learning still how to deal with startups and actually create value within the business. And that's actually the, the both sides of the story that we see. And that's not a three-month game. That's, that's a three-year game. So if I was a, um, a large corporate, um, a ship operator, realizing that this is the trend, I could expect it to take me three years before I see any value out of this engagement or it could take real that three years to see any real value out of an engagement with a startup that's got a solution for me that could um, impact my global operations so in that respect why would I why would I as a as a uh, business with a you know look for business to business solutions go through this process of three years when when and going back to what Matt was saying a minute ago you know we'll look, they're looking they tend to look for quick solutions as well uh, to whom uh, are you asking this question is it for me uh, uh, that's you Mari Mari yes please yeah 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 um, I think you have no other option what I see I see so many companies in our sector struggle uh, some of these companies are on top, uh, and uh, some of these companies that are on top are happy about it that they're on top, which is obviously very fine, but they don't see what's happening around them, and and some of them are struggling with their margins or, or in other ways. And I think 
what I see happening, uh, but also I've got my own limited view here because I'm mainly working with the companies that actually start to realize this. But I think um, more and more companies realize that not in, uh, no innovation, and, again, and startups is not the holy grail. I think startups is just an, part of the equation of innovation. Eh? So there's all kind of innovation that the corporate, corporate could engage with. But startup is an, is an element in that. And, and more corporates start to see that I think innovation is going to, is, is going to be an integral, integrated part of any business. Uh, and it actually it should already be. Because what's happening on the technology side, what's happening in China, what's happening in the global dynam uh, dynamics means you've got to adapt your company every day again. And without innovation, it's just it's not it's not working because people are not moving. People are doing what they were they're told to be done and what they have have been doing the last ten years. And I see companies that that don't transform and they just get run run over and passed by all kind of other organizations or companies or, or products or services. So, I, yeah, I think this is where, where it's going pretty fast. And for the one that that. And, and, and yes, it's investing three years or maybe even more, but if you're not doing it, and uh, they will feel, feel the pain. And I think some of them are actually already feeling that pain. Some of them have pains for other reasons, but I think I see quite some companies struggling just because they haven't changed the way they've been doing. They still use printed documents, they use, uh, faxes, telegrams. Uh, you know, it's, it's really, I tell it sometimes to people that are not from the sector and they start laughing at me. It's like, is this really happening? I say, yes, this is really still happening. So, yeah, I, th I think it's just, I think it's just obvious. Let me just uh, ask here, Hanan, uh, from the docs perspective, what are the kinds of companies that you get in that you help accelerate? And how are they managing to meet that three-year um, period um, that Mare or even the demand that the ship owners wants. It, uh, it seems to me like it's a, a rather complex challenge of meeting a sort of the, the, the industrial just kind of solutions that would take three years, yet the, um, the need for quick solutions that a, a ship operator such as uh, Greek Star would look for. Okay, so first, uh, Craig, thanks for uh, hosting me, and uh, I'd like maybe very shortly to refer to the question as to why would corporate engage indeed uh, with the three-year process, two- or three-year process, uh, before I talk about uh, uh, the startup side and the accelerator. And what I'd like to add here, and this was mentioned before, is that uh, uh, while there is a lot of uh, uh, many solutions, off-the-shelf off solutions, which might be very relevant in order to uh, improve different processes such as paperwork, and these could be available off the shelf. In parallel to uh, looking at those, corporate, uh, corporates, I, I find, are also very interested to find out what's going to be happening two or three years, what crazy ideas might be coming to the market two or three years ahead, and this is really the reason not so much to have something up and running and working within six months' time, because everybody understands that will not come from the occasional early-stage startup, but rather uh, have an idea about ideation, about uh, different trends in the market. Uh, and also, on top of that, we need to realize that uh, uh, engaging with startups and with accelerators brings another value to corporates, which I learned, and this has to do with maybe softer issues such as the human resources, HR. Basically, uh, uh, those corporates are benefiting from what I will call a fresh breeze uh, of ideation, which uh, many of them are trying to, uh, to establish as maybe a new way of life uh, into a conservative, otherwise conservative world. So uh, that's on that end. Now, in terms of uh, companies that uh, we are accelerating, uh, there are different ways to break those uh, uh, into uh, groups. I will say maybe an interesting perspective of looking at that question is that uh, some of those startups are startups that uh, are, are, uh, are being founded specifically to attend to challenges in, uh, in uh, the space, in the domain, namely in the maritime or uh, transport logistic domain. But uh, some others were taking a more proactive approach 
and, uh, and uh, we identify startups which have interesting technologies uh, which currently are uh, targeting other domains, and, uh, and uh, we are trying to show them the strategic uh, need and maybe business case to attend to uh, our domain as well. And maybe uh, just one uh, or two examples. For example, a startup that deals with uh, fast charging of uh, electric uh, trucks. When, uh, when uh, we identified an interesting business case with one of our partners which is interested in the future hybrid ferry and the possibility of applying the technology of uh, fast charging batteries uh, to the domain of a uh, short, uh, short uh, 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 leg uh, hybrid ferries of the future. So that's one example. Or another example, a serial entrepreneur that was dealing in the past with robotics for uh, logistic depots and all of a sudden they got exposed to the needs of the future autonomous crane where many of their algorithms and technologies might be applicable. So we have different types of uh, startups which are attending and applying to our program uh, coming from, uh, you know, some of them were sort of reactive and some of them were more proactive in trying to show them the light and the interest in what we do. Is that, um, just uh, go back to that, uh, one of those earlier points, and, and also um, one of the uh, the comments that's come in on the chat board, um, coming to back to from the corporates, uh, the large corporate perspective, when you're looking for innovation, I'm going to ask actually ask this this question of uh, Annick Verhoeven. Um, startups and innovation, that this uh, the difference between the corporate garage concept versus startups, and I guess this refers to looking for the solutions internally compared to looking for solutions externally. How do you, what approach does a company like AP Miller Musk take to that? Yes, I think that both are, both are important. I think that um, uh, innovation as such, it, it comes from, from, from different angles. It can come from interaction with startups. It can, it can come from our large uh, traditional suppliers that are uh, offering new solutions and it can come from the ideas we have internally and we, we develop ourselves. Um, we have a, a digital department in, uh, in Copenhagen as well as in, uh, in India and so we are building software products ourselves um, as well. And we are using uh, our people and that have the, the vast operational knowledge and, and come with great ideas. So I think that is all important. I think one one other comment I, wa I wanted to make on what was what was just discussed is that I personally I, I don't I don't like to see I don't like the the, the word startup so much because a startup can also be a a, a highly specialized very successful younger company with 75 people in a great office in San Francisco um, that is building a fantastic product. And what I see is that um, when we are looking for solutions for, for problems that we have identified, whether it be something for, you know, here and now or something further out in the future, it is not always the case that the best solutions come from the large companies that we traditionally have bought um, equipment from or software from. Sometimes these companies can, can help us. Other times they are not fast enough or they do not have the solution. And that is why I think we are not working with startups for the sake of working with startups and because it's cool and because, you know, you get, you get some, you know, fresh breath of air. We are looking at what younger and new companies uh, develop because oftentimes that's the only place where solutions can be found and where you can find a, a team that can help you um, deliver the solution you're looking for. I think that is important to say that, that smaller teams, younger companies um, can often or can, can at times um, provide a solution that is better suited for us, that, it, that can maybe be faster implemented. Perhaps they have more focus to us because we are not one of 1,000 customers, but maybe we're, you know, among the first 20 customers. And, uh, and we see great value in that. And, and also, I've heard this phrase before. You, um, 
companies um, have a, well, I, I realize, um, Annick, you're saying that you don't like the word startup all the time, but a startup mentality. So, and I'm guessing this means that they, they have an innovation mentality um, within um, a division. Um, I've heard a couple of companies yeah. say that they have a, they have a startup or they have a division that's behaving like it's a startup within the company. Is that the case then that you you create that startup, push it very quickly, see whether it works, have that accelerator attitude, but do that internally within the business? Yeah, yes, absolutely. We this is this is how we work in, in the digital department together with the teams from the business. Um, we are you, you know we we we're we're spearheading also. Um, Working in an agile manner, uh, not having, um, especially when you build software, right? So, so we are focusing on building software, and and there, um, we do not want to have in detailed plan uh, for for three years on how to build the software product. It has to be in in phases, and there has to be customer feedback, etc. Um, and so, we are also bringing in uh, new colleagues uh, in this department that come from startups, and that actually have never worked for a corporate. So this is the only way that they uh, that they work and they know how to work and also the only way they would like to work. So I think it is extremely important to also drive that internally because I can see that what was earlier discussed, if you have no understanding or if you have are not familiar at all with the way startups work and the speed and the, the you know, the, the, the changes that that happen throughout the process, then there 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 will be obstacles in the collaboration between a corporate and a startup. I think for us, uh, we we very much uh, like to work that way. So so we uh, yeah we we we, uh, we are maybe a bit more familiar with that in corporates that have not yet um, introduced these ways of working. Rick, can I can I can add something just, quickly? Uh, sure. Yes. This is Hanan. I'd like to add something quickly. I think the out-of-the-box way of thinking is very critical to this, uh, uh, to, to, as, as a component to the recipe of how to have that open innovation. And out-of-the-box comes usually from outside the corporate. And really when somebody like, you know, when the doc signs an agreement for cooperation with Maersk, it's much more than just Maersk and the doc. We are actually talking Maersk, as Anik said, representing the whole market, customers, suppliers, everybody on their side, and we are representing or talking to the Microsofts and the Amazon Web Services and the IBMs, Googles of the world. So actually you have two uh, different disciplines meeting together, which is really what drives all that uh, disruption and innovation. There was actually um, one of the comments that I was just, just uh, similar to that. Um, before we close this second part of the Smart Talk and move over to the networking area, I just actually wanted to ask Matt Duke at Greek Star um, a, a similar question about um, the need to think out of the box and the need to also recognize that, well, actually, it was a comment I had from a CEO of a um, tanker company, a gas tanker company, a couple of weeks ago, who said innovation and all of these changes, the digitalization and they're all very incremental things. What I need to find is a solution that in really endears me with my clients. So the shippers, in his case, his company, you know, has got a large um, energy majors and chemical majors that are his main clients. So he needs to find solutions that appeal to that so he can be more integrated with his clients' needs. And those are increasingly digital needs, digital solutions that they're having. So he wants to be more integrated into that. So, so my question to you, Matt, is when you're looking at all of these um, ideas and that, are you always looking at your own operations? Or at the end of the day, are you mostly looking at how the clients of a company like Greed Star, how their needs and demands are changing and how you fit into that new way of operating, the new normal? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, we uh, we have two very distinct management 
strategic pillars related to this. Number one is what you might call the doomsday clock. So what, what's happening that could potentially Amazon us out of the business? You know, so basically, how can we still be relevant to the cargo owners, I would say? Uh, uh, now, from Greek Star's perspective, we have the, um, the ship management side and the ship ownership side um, of the pool partner. So we're not on the commercial, we're not doing the chartering and the operations, but at the same time, we're keeping an eye on what's going on out there so that as our pool partner has greater needs, our assets are able to follow those needs. And to, you know, put in very basic terms, we need to have digitalized our uh, shipping assets so that when new opportunities arise, you know, you're not going to suddenly find out, oh, well, we don't have the internet connection or we don't have a, a robust cyber security strategy for the vessels or whatever it might be. Um, because, because remember that when we talk about um, startups, right, they're challenging often the existing technology uh, companies and they have this incredible velocity uh, to, de to deliver hopefully value. But at the same time, if it's a hardware uh, delivery, um, at the end of the day, we've got to think about support, logistics, production challenges. You know, it's, it's, it's great that you show me in a lab that you've got the best sensor in the whole world, but now I need uh, 20,000 of them on, on 130 vessels, and you need to be able to deploy those in the right places, right? So, so we have this kind of challenge in that we have to make sure that we uh, are not going to be a, um, a kind of a, a, a steam engine uh, a shipping company that doesn't see that diesel electrics coming in at the same time that we have to capture and grab as much value in short small steps uh, concurrently so I think by doing that by doing small incremental digital improvements you kind of your risk of not seeing the disruption coming or the risk of not having the opportunity to be part of a new change in business uh, is less and I think autonomy has to be one of those uh, classic examples. Um, you know, it might not be today that we could have a fully autonomous um, uh, vessel, but uh, if you start looking at uh, uh, crewless bridges in the future and, and, and opportunities to maybe automate um, uh, port time operations, then if you don't do that, then I'm sure that ultimately the customers will be wanting the best most efficient, cheapest, and most transparent partners, and we'll lose that opportunity.